Every character within our Torah is presented to us with a different um, characteristics, a different trait. And just by the way they were able to deal with different circumstances that they had to come by throughout their lives, we could tell what type of personality they truly were. Our Parashiyot introduced to us one of the greatest men who have ever lived, first of the patriarchs, a man by the name of Abraham Avinu, Abraham. And if we were to ask ourselves, what made Abraham so great? What made Abraham one of the greatest people? What made him so special? If you analyze his life, you find that what made Abraham so powerful, and someone to look up to, is the fact that he was someone who loved to perform kindness, a person who loved to run after people to do them favors, a generous person. And this week's parasha, parasha Vayera, shows us exactly what it means to perform a true kindness. The Torah tells us, Vaisa and Av, Abraham was sitting in the heat of the day, and all of a sudden he lifts up his eyes. Vaya, and he saw, he sees three men standing before him, and he sees them, and so he runs after them. So we have to stop right here and ask ourselves, why is it that the verse seems to be redundant? Why is it that it continuously says that he saw them? He lifts up his eyes, which means he saw them, and then it says, and so he saw them, and then it tells us who he saw, and he continues to tell us that he saw them, and so he runs after them. What's with the repetition? He saw them, why can't he just run after them after the first time he saw them? And the answer is that, first of all, no word and no letter within our Torah is extra. There is no extra ink within the Torah. Everything is coming to convey a certain message. And again, what is the message that is being conveyed over here? And the answer is that Torah is teaching us a very powerful lesson in sensitivity. How many times do we pass by somebody who is in need of help, and we're so self-absorbed with ourselves, and we're on the run, and we don't have time for anybody because we have enough of our own problems, and we just, if someone is turning to us for tzedakah, for ch- charity, we just throw the quarter at them, we don't even look at them. And we just move on. So the Torah says, if you want to do kindness, it's nice, but learn how to do the kindness. And so it says, Vaisa and I, lift up your eyes, make eye contact. Show the person that you care, that you want to help them. And then it says, Vaisa and then you will see what this person is really all about, because if you don't look, you don't know what that person is in need of. And finally, it tells us the third time that he saw, because the third time, then you could see what is it that you could do for that person to benefit him, and then you could run to help that person. But it's interesting, because the Torah continues and says, after he sees the people, after he sees these three men, it says he runs after them as if they're doing him a favor, and he says, if I could find favor in your eyes. What is the meaning of these words, if I could find favor in your eyes? Who's doing who the favor? If anything, they should run up to Abraham and they should say, if you could find favor in our eyes and you could allow us to come to your house and you could uh, you know, uh, you know, join, allow us to join you and give, maybe cook something for us. But the Torah seems to tell us that Abraham, it makes it look as if they're doing him a, fa- as if they're doing him a favor. And the answer to this question is, because that's how you do a favor. You make it look as if they're doing you a chesed, a you, a you a kindness. You know, my wife, last night, she was driving to a wedding. The wedding was about an hour away. In the beginning of the ride, she got a phone call from somebody she wasn't really interested in picking up because she knew it would be a long conversation. The person had a lot of things to talk about, uh, a lot of things to get off their shoulders. And my wife felt, you know, I'll do this person a kindness and I'll speak to them. And she spoke to her for about an hour until she got to the wedding. And at the end of the conversation, the lady turns to her and she said, you know, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so grateful. You gave me an hour of your time. You, know, you probably have so many things to do and you, you gave me your time. She said, no, no, you're doing me a favor because this whole ride here, I know one to talk to. And you, you kept me company. That's what it means to show somebody that they're doing you a favor. You're driving on the road and you see somebody who needs a ride. And you stop for them and you say, do you need a ride? And they say, you're probably going out of, it's out of your way, don't worry about it. And you act as if it's on your way, and as if they're doing you a favor because, you know, they're going to keep you company in the car. That's what it means to make you look as if someone's doing you a favor. That's how you do a kindness. You know, in the English alphabet, I cannot tell you why each letter is next to the next letter. I cannot explain to you why the A is next to the B or B is next to the C. Nor can I tell you why it's, config- why it's shaped the way it is or why it sounds the way it does. It just, it's just the way it is because people decided to make it that way. But in the Hebrew alphabet, there's much wisdom and there's depth behind every single letter. Why this letter is behind this letter and this letter is in front of this letter. For instance, the Gemara tells us the letter Gimel. Here's the picture of a Gimel. And, and the Gemara tells us the word gimel comes from the letter gimel comes from the word gimul, gimul, which means to give, as in gimul chasadim, to perform kindness, to run. So the gimel is like a little person approaching somebody. He has his legs stationed 
uh, firmly to the ground, and he's approaching somebody with his hand out as if he's giving. But to be a giver, you need a receiver. So who's the next letter after the gimel? The dalid. And the dalid is standing straight up and he's asking for help. Well, listen well, and pay attention how the gimel is approaching the dalid. He approaches him from the back as if he's running after him. If anything, the dalid who's asking it should be running after the gimel. But in this case, the gimel shows us how to perform the kindness. He's running after him as if the dalid is doing him the favor. But the dalid has his back facing towards the gimel because he feels uncomfortable taking from him. And so he feels ashamed, and so he looks away, and the gimel understands that. And so he shows him sensitivity, and he shows him recognition, he shows him acknowledgement. You know, when do you know a leaf is ready to fall off a tree? When it's facing towards the tree. As long as it's facing away from the tree, that shows that it's ashamed because it keeps taking from the tree. As long as someone's taking, they don't feel comfortable. It's, it's all too well known that nobody wants to be on the receiving end. So somebody wants to ask me, I understand, there's a whole story over here. The gimel is, taking, the, gimel is the giver, the dalit is the taker. So then, what's the next letter after dalit? So I said, the hey. So I, they said, so why is the hey next to the dalit? So I said, oh, you're asking a beautiful question. Because the hey stands for Hashem. And the dalit understands, although he's receiving from the gimel, on the, on, at the end of the day, there's no one you can rely on, but on the one above. So he asks, he turns to God. Because no doctor, no technology, nobody in this world could help me. But Hashem. And that's the, that's the depth behind the letters. I'm giving you just a small flavor behind the letters of, our, of, of, our, of, of the Hebrew alphabet. But there's so much more. But again, the message here is how the Gimel is approaching the Dalit and is showing him sensitivity. So I want to share with you just a short story that shows us what it means to perform a true kindness, to go beyond the call of duty and to see more than what meets the eye. There was an old man in a nursing home by the name of Mr. Lefkowitz. Mr. Lefkowitz lost his life at some point of his life, and he was in this nursing home for quite a while. And usually in nursing homes, every room is two in a room. He had a whole room for himself. One day, the nurse walks into his room, and she says, you know, Mr. Lef Mr. Lefkowitz, there's a patient who has been trying to get into this nursing home for so long, and everybody's two in a room, and you're the only one who has a whole room for themselves. Is there any way possible that you could share this room with them? And he says, you know what, bring them in. I would love to have a roommate. It's getting lonely in here. And the next day, they wheel in this old man. And they put him and they lay him down on, this, on his bed. And they say, okay, Mr. Friedman, you're good to go. If you have any questions, please do pull the string. And we'll be more than happy to assist you. And they leave the room. And Mr. Lefkowitz is just this jolly guy. He's so happy. He's so upbeat. He gets onto his wheelchair because he can't walk. And he rolls over to the other side of the room. And he says, Mr. Friedman, welcome to paradise. Welcome to my room. And Mr. Friedman is like, hey, get away from me, get away from me, old man, get away from me, I don't want to talk to you. He says, hey, Friedman, this is my room. And he's like, I don't want no friends, I don't want to get away from me. Mr. Lefkowitz is taken aback, he just, met, he just met his opposite. So he goes back to his side of the room, and he's thinking, okay, it's his first day in the nursing home, maybe now is not a good time, I'll try again tomorrow. Fine, they fall asleep that night. In the middle of the night, Mr. Lefkowitz wakes up, and he hears crying from the other side of the room. He wakes up, he gets on his wheelchair, he rolls over to the other side and, side and he says, Mr. Friedman, is everything okay? He says, look at me. He looks at him and he says, okay, you look pretty good. He says, no, take a closer look. He looks again, he says, I don't see where you're going with this. He says, look at my eyes. He looks at his eyes and he sees there's pretty blue eyes. He says, I'm blind, Mr. Lefkowitz, I'm blind. I haven't seen the sunset or the sunrise. I haven't seen my children or my grandchildren for the past 40 years of my life. Mr. Lefkowitz is a happy guy, because he can see. So get back to your side of the room and never talk to me again. Mr. Lefkowitz gets back to his side of the room. He gets back to his bed. He's like, this guy is blind. I can't believe I even started with him. He's, he's grumpy. He deserves to be miserable. But it bothers him, because he feels bad. He wishes he could help him with his situation. The next morning, Mr. Lefkowitz wakes up. And he's thinking of a way to make Mr. Friedman feel better. So he finally comes up with a brilliant idea. He turns to Mr. Friedman, and he says, you know, Friedman, I want to tell you something. My whole life I was a painter. I could look at a picture, and I could describe to you detail for detail things that most people wouldn't see. So allow me to look at the window and tell you what's going on outside the window, and hopefully I'll be able to paint the picture in your mind. And I promise you, if it doesn't work out at the end of the hour, you don't like it, I know you don't want to speak to me, you don't want to know me, I promise I'll leave you alone, and we'll pretend like we don't exist. So Mr. Friedman says, okay, if this is what it takes to get you off my back, Go ahead. He figured, you know, at the end of it all, he'll just tell me they don't like it and he'll leave him alone. 
So he starts describing to him detail for detail what he sees. He starts describing the clouds, minuscule clouds, and this type of clouds, and he goes into the color of the sky, and he starts talking about how a bird just landed on the ledge of the window, and how there are people walking on the street, and he's describing a lady who's walking her child across the street to the school, and a woman who's walking out with a dog and the, uh, out of the E-train, and so on. For, goes, this goes on for an hour. And slowly, Mr. Friedman, Mr. Friedman starts cracking a smile. And he's like, this guy's amazing. And after the hour, he turns to him and he says, so, what do you think? He says, you know what, Lefkowitz, not so bad. Let's do it again tomorrow. To make a long story short, this goes on for an entire year. I mean, these guys, went, eventually, they went from speaking what's, out, what's going on outside, they got to know each other on a much more personal level. And, one, you know, this guy, Mr. Friedman, he wasn't able to, to see Mr. Lefkowitz couldn't walk, so Mr. Lefkowitz would get on top of Mr. Friedman's shoulders, and he would be the eyes, and he would be the legs, and they'll run around the entire nursing home like two maniacs. These guys were like inseparable, like a circus. And after a year, after a year of this going on, Mr. Friedman calls, home, calls over Mr. Lefkowitz, and he tells you, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you that my whole life I was running after my career. I never had time for anybody. I never paid attention to a snowflake. I never paid attention to a leaf. I never paid attention to a rose. But I want to tell you, when he starts breaking down, he tells him that seeing with you, with my eyes now, is seeing much more when I was able to see. And of course they cry, and they hug each other, and they embrace each other. What a beautiful relationship. And a few days later, Mr. Friedman wakes up, and he says, Lefko, come on, tell me what's going on outside that window. Now it's Lefko and Friedman, they're really close. He says, Lefko, what's going on outside the window? And there's no response. And again, what's going on outside the window? Tell me what's going on. And no one's responding. So he gets nervous and he starts pulling the string and the nurse runs into the room and she says, is everything okay? He says, where's my friend? Where's my buddy Lefko? She says, I'm so sorry to break the news to you, but Mr. Lefkowitz had a heart attack and a heart condition. He passed away last night. He says, you mean I lost my eyes for a second time? He says, what time is the funeral? She says, one o'clock. What time is it now? Nine o'clock. What time is it exactly? Nine one. He's thinking nine one, nine one. He says, can you do me a favor? Every single day at 9.01, there's a lady walking out of the train with a dog. Can you just describe to me what's going on? Can you uphold this tradition that I have with Mr. Lefkowitz? She says, excuse me? He says, yeah, look out the window and tell me what's going on outside the window. She says, Mr. Friedman, this room, this building, is connected to an apartment building. She says, if you feel around the room, you'll find there are no windows in this room. He says, what are you talking about? Of course there's a window in this room. You're lying to me. He gets out of his bed. He's, he's stripping over everything. He gets to the other side of the room. He feels around. He feels that there's nobody in that bed. And he realizes Mr. Lefkowitz is really gone. And then he starts feeling the walls and he goes around the room until he realizes there are no windows in that room. For a whole year, Mr. Lefkowitz made up a baloney story that there was a window in that room just so he could create an image in Mr. Lister Friedman's mind. Just so he could create a picture to give him the eyes that he so much desired. And of course, Mr. Freeman made it his business to attend Mr. Lefkowitz's funeral. And he gets behind the podium and he tells everybody the story. And he says, there was no window in that room. But sometimes we have to create that window. Sometimes there's a wall between us. And sometimes we have to, be, we have to use imagination. And I say, if we could use our imagination for others. And we say, there's no hope. There's nothing I could possibly do. And we use our imagination and we go beyond the call of duty. And we do whatever it takes to help that person. When you're in a time of need and you're in a time of trouble, God's going to say, well, I'll use my imagination. Although it's against, it's against all odds and against nature, I'll break my nature for you. I'll break, I'll go ahead and I'll be creative enough to help you in your situation because you were creative enough for others. So let us take the message of the Gimel, how he proceeds, how he, how he approaches the Dalit. Let us take the message of Mr. Lefkowitz and let us most of all take the message of Abraham Avinu. Vaisa and Nav, lift up your eyes, show that person you care. And then you could run and then you could help them and then you could perform the, most, the biggest kindness of all. Thank you for listening.